Hello, 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 my friends. Jill Osborne, Interstitial Cystitis Network. It is time for another support group meeting. I'm trying to get things set up here. Hold on one sec. Okay, pop that discussion thing out. All right, Facebook has popped out. All righty then. Hello, Facebook. Hello, YouTube. How are you guys doing today? So, um, okay, we got to check the light here. Is the light okay? It's kind of pale. Now, you guys, I'm a support group leader. I'm not a technology geek. Uh, what do I need to do? What would happen if I remove this? Would that make a difference? Let us see. Is that better? Okay. Nope. <laughs> That's shiny. Hello, you guys. I just try to figure this out here. Let's see if that's better. All right. So my purpose in doing these meetings is to make you so strong, so knowledgeable, so informed that no one can mess with you again. I don't want anybody to tell you. Um, I don't want anybody to tell you that this is all in your head. I don't want anybody telling you that the, you are damaged goods or all that sort of stuff. Donna, no worries, honey. We're all crazy, crazy busy. Um, so, and of course, right now, somebody's calling me. Give me one sec. I'll be right back. Hold on. Alrighty then. Alrighty then. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. So, guys, it's been a very, very busy week here at the IC Network. Uh, I spent Thursday, the reason why I didn't do a live support group meeting on Thursday on Facebook for you, my friends on Facebook, is that I was doing almost a four hour stream to Israel that day. And I want to thank the Israeli IC Association for inviting me to speak. I had a blast. We had a lot of fun conversations. And, um, uh, it's always important. You know, I've been thinking about this a lot. Like, oh, I was listening to a lecture uh, that was trying to get you to think about what are your weaknesses? What are your weaknesses? And because how can you get better if you don't understand what your weaknesses are? Yeah, okay, we got a weak bladder and all that sort of stuff. But we also have other weaknesses. And one of my weaknesses is I tend to tunnel. I tend to hybrid. I tend to uh, nest at home. And I like, a, you know, as much as I would, and I've been invited around the world to speak about IC, and I have traveled part, partially went around the world to do that. But if push comes to shove, if I have a preference, I just want to be here. And that's one of my weaknesses, is I don't get out and do more. Um, and I would love to go to Israel, and I, would, I was invited to India to go to India to speak. And I, I just find that it's hard, you know, and I think part of it is PTSD from traveling when my IC was really, really severe. And part of it is just kind of being comfortable here. So anyway, I want to do as many events as I can. I want to talk to as many people as I can. And maybe one of the gifts of COVID is that we're all optimizing our online presence a little bit more. All right. So. So let's see. So Thursday we were talking with um, Israel Group, and then Friday I was training. I was training yet more attorneys, group of six attorneys, about interstitial cystitis in Elmeron, uh, with respect to the um, lawsuits that are going on right now with Elmeron. And um, uh, that's just important. It's important that they understand. Uh, the last thing I I left them with as we kind of went over what I see is and pain and all that sort of stuff. The one thing I really emphasized with them is that um, they needed to take care with every patient they talked with, because we know that some of you are, you know, if you can't do Elmeron, Elmeron's like the one thing that's really worked for some people. If you got estrogen atrophy, genitourinary syndrome of menopause, which we call 
uh, IC or bladder pain syndrome subtype two, that's where something like a coating really is beneficial, something that can kind of protect your bladder. And I know that some of you out there, you know, you, you've been very terrified ab about losing your Elmeron, but you also, some of you are also having changes in your vision and you know, you need to do it. But that said, what are your options? Um, and so, and for people who don't know, Elmeron is the only oral FDA approved drug for interstitial cystitis. It was approved in 1996. Hundreds of thousands of patients in all likelihood have used it. Um, we have known kind of from day one that it didn't work for everybody. In fact, it really barely worked above placebo. But if you look at the various research studies with Elmeron, uh, the great majority of them say it's really not much better than placebo, although the, some studies found it more effective than that, maybe in the area of 50%, 60%, something like that. But we've certainly also known from day one that bladder therapies didn't work for a lot of people. Elmeron didn't work for a lot of people. Why? Because for a lot of people, your symptoms are not coming from your bladder wall. Your symptoms are coming from something else. It could be a fibroid tumor pushing on your bladder. It could be tight pelvic floor muscles. It could be a broken tailbone. It could be a Tarlov cyst. It could be pelvic congestion syndrome. There are a number of things that can mimic the symptoms of IC. But of course, we didn't know that 25, 30 years ago. 25, 30 years ago, man, it was bladder disease. Everybody got put on Elmeron. And there are some patients who have been on Elmeron for decades. I, I worked with one lady who ran out of money. Her entire life savings went into Elmeron. And I asked her on the phone, I said, well, did it help you? And she goes, no. And I said, then why did you keep taking it? And she said, because there was nothing else that they gave me. And if you, you know, if you look at our guidelines now, the American Urology Association guidelines now, they're really crystal clear. If a therapy isn't working for you, you need to stop it. You know, the, the whole point here is to not keeping medic medicine that is not working for you. So what can somebody do? Well, you can do, rather than taking Elmeron by mouth, you can take Elmeron directly in your bladder in the form of a bladder installation. And the advantage of that is 100% of the medication arrives in your bladder. Whereas if you take it by mouth, only 8%, if you're lucky, arrives in your bladder. 92% of Elmeron is destroyed by digestion, right? And so the best way to use Elmeron, since it's the equivalent of kind of a coating or a Band-Aid in the bladder, is to put it directly in the bladder. Don't even swallow it. Just stick it in your bladder. That's called a rescue installation. They can use heparin and lidocaine or Elmeron and lidocaine. And the advantage of that is the medication stays in the bladder wall. It's not something that it's going to reach into the, the bloodstream circulatory system to any great degree where it can travel throughout your body and cause issues. They believe that the majority of that medicine stays right in the bladder wall. So that's an option. You could certainly switch to that. There's no other oral medication that, that mimics the same effect as Elmeron. And so most patients usually transition over to chondroitin-based supplements. And they started doing that years ago. You know, when Elmeron went off patent like 10, 12 years ago, you know, uh, immediately, well, when a medication goes off patent, what does that mean? It means that a generic manufacturer can step in and start making it, right? And so immediately, uh, the company that had Elmeron at that time raised the price because they knew that a generic was potentially coming soon. And in fact, the gen a generic was, is available in Canada and in Europe. It's made by a company called Swati Spentos in India. But of course, we didn't really have that here in the United States. So, but then there again, so the price of Elmeron went up and it went up so high, a lot of patients simply could not afford it. They just couldn't afford it. And so they started transitioning to supplements years ago and they went to Sister Protect first. And in fact, Dr. Parsons, the guy who made Elmeron, invented Elmeron and Dr. Thea Harides, the guy who invented Sister Protect appeared together in 2006 at the San Diego IC conference where they talked specifically about that. So um, um, that's where we are. So Sister Protec is an older formula now. It's still available. It's had its hard times here and there. Uh, but we also have Bladder Builder, Bladder Rest, Sister Man. We've got some other viable products that patients can sort of switch to too. So if you are trying to get off of Elmeron, you can come on over to the IC Network website. We have an Elmeron transition guide to kind of walk you through some of those options. All right. Pamela here on Facebook says, I can't get a lawyer for Elmeron. My eyesight got worse. It didn't work. I can't drive at night now for years. All right. So Pamela, um, 
Uh, if you go over onto our website, you're going to see in the right hand column, if you go to any page, there's an advertisement for one firm. And then I'm bringing on another firm. And so you can reach out to me if you send me an email. Uh, I can give you uh, the, the contact information for the attorneys that, that we have worked with. We've worked with four separate firms, so one well, more than four separate groups of attorneys, far more than that. Uh, Tunes and more says it made my hair fall out, my liver enzymes raise, and that and now I have years later anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. All nightmarish experiments made me worse in one way. Honey, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. We didn't know, you know, I mean, all right. So hold on a second. Are we having an issue with Facebook? Okay. Facebook, it says you're live. Are, is everything okay over on Facebook? If you can, can you guys, if you can write something in there, uh, Anne says, can you get a, a flare from vaginal atrophy? Of course you can. Absolutely. Of course you can, because that skin is meant to be very thick and moist. Um, and that moisture comes from estrogen. And so your body needs that estrogen to produce that nice, thick, protective coating in your vagina, on your vulva, in your urethra, and on your, in your bladder. And so when your estrogen levels drop, your skin gets drier and drier. And as your skin gets drier and drier, it, it starts to hurt. You know, how does dry mouth feel? It hurts. Well, dry vagina hurts. It's not fun. Um, okay, so Facebook again, Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. Can somebody on Facebook please... Post something in there so I can see if it's working or not. We haven't, I haven't seen anything in four minutes. I, you know, I don't know what the heck happened to Facebook this summer, but it's just gotten so weird. My screen says it's live. My screen says we've got 28 people watching. Oh, wait, my screen... John Loretta says Facebook is unwatchable. Okay, you guys, for Facebook is not working, come on over to YouTube. Oh, wow. Facebook is cutting out every 10 seconds. All right, so for those of you on Facebook, scroll back 10 seconds and just start it again. Let's see. Marcia says it's going in and out. Um, let me look at this. Oh, yeah. Well, the stream metrics are. All right. Hold on a sec. Guys, give, give me a moment here for you guys on YouTube. I, I appreciate it. Give me a moment. Let me just make sure that it wasn't trying to run over a wireless. All right. Facebook, one, two, three. Facebook, one, two, three. Try it again, guys. Give me a... Okay. Yeah, <laughs> because I want to... Okay, tell you what. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop Facebook, and I'm going to start it again. Uh, for YouTube, here... Okay, for anybody on Facebook who's having an issue, come on over to YouTube and you can watch it on YouTube. And I'm gonna I'm gonna restart it, okay? Sorry guys. Give me a moment. Yeah, it's bad. Yeah, look at that. Whoa, a whopping 14 minutes on Facebook. Yeah. Far short of our five hour streams we used to do. All right, so hold on a second. Let me see if I can. All right, Facebook, uh, you guys, hold on. Let me see if I can just get this started again. I don't know what to do. I do not know what to do with Facebook. You guys, you guys are difficult. All right, hold on.
All right. So let's see. Let's get that. We got to get that. Got to get that. Audience settings. No, that's fine. Dashboard. Yeah. Come on, Facebook. You son of a gun. Settings, stream, stream latency, auto. Okay, I'm 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 gonna switch it to a low oh, slightly lower visual quality, right? Crap. Uh yeah, well, we got nothing to lose. Let's give it a shot. All right, you guys, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Let's see if this works. All righty. All righty. All righty. All righty. So, so, um, uh, anyway, what were we talking about? We were talking about Elmeron. Okay. So you can come on over to the IC Network website and uh, go to our Elmeron Transition Center, or you can go over to the IC Network store. We, we happen to have some of the supplements and you can do that over there. Now, normally when I do these meetings, I do kind of a 30 minute lecture and then I will usually take your questions for as long as you want. And then we can go into Zoom if people want to go into Zoom. Um, I um, so we we are just finishing up our IC Optimi our fall IC Optimist magazine. It is at the last steps of the typesetter. I should be do, uh, reviewing the final proof tomorrow, and then it will be on its way to the printer. Um, that said, I pulled an article I didn't like, and I rewrote and I rewrote a new article kind of on the fly, and I want to talk to you guys about it because I'd never really talked about this before. So. Um, and for Facebook here, anybody on Facebook, if you're watching, uh, could you do me a favor and just write something in the comments so I can see if it's working or not? Because we did start it up on Facebook again. Okay, so let me get this article because I, I really want to talk to you guys about this a little bit. So hold on a sec. It is on my, here it is. Hi, Bethany. Okay. So normally in my fall magazine, I usually do something about the holidays. You know, I mean, we, I have, we have videos on how to approach the holidays. If you're newly diagnosed, I've got videos on how to deal with awkward discussions with family members. You can find all those over on the IC Network website. But now that we have our subtypes, right? Now that we know that there are many variants in this patient population. So Hunter's lesions, number one, number two, bladder wall driven, number three, pelvic floor driven, number four, pudendal neuralgia, and number five, central sensitization, patients with chronic overlapping pain conditions. And, and I've talked about this before because I'm in this la I am a pelvic floor patient combined with a central sensitization patient. So I have two or more overlapping pain conditions. I've got IC. I had IBS, it's very controlled, TMJ, but not so controlled, um, uh, vulvodynia, completely controlled, but there have been times in my life where they have all been active. They've all been quite, quite active. And I, I have to say that the holidays have were, especially my 20s and 30s, right when all these conditions were were just beating, my, beating me up. Um, it was very hard for me to enjoy the holidays. I, I just didn't feel well. Um, and, and it started when I was like 24, right? So the IBS started when I was like 22. And then in my middle 20s, I started getting all these kind of allergy slash sensitivities. And hi, David. Oh, David's pre-diabetes. Rebecca is still cutting out. All right. So you guys on YouTube, if, it's, if I mean, on Facebook, come on over to the YouTube channel. I'll put you, I'll give you the link. YouTube.com. Whoops. Hold on. 
All right. So for Facebook, if you're cutting in and out, just come on over to YouTube and it won't cut in and out. Okay. So like mysteriously in my 20s, I started getting really sick during the holidays. Okay. David says Facebook terrible. Sorry. Okay. So come on over. Come on over. Looks like Facebook's. We'll probably just turn it off. Okay. And, you know, and this was at that point in time where people were like, what the hell's wrong with Jill? What is it now? Okay, it's her bowel. Or at first it's her bladder. Then it's her vulva. Like, what the hell is wrong with Jill? Well, Jill didn't know what was wrong with Jill. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I didn't. But there came a point in time where, like when I was like 24, I started getting really dizzy and nauseous over the holidays. I mean, like I felt so ill and I didn't know why I felt so ill. It was strange. It was really, 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 really strange. And, you know, kind of some other things. I figured out the IBS was because I, of chocolate and because of oatmeal. So we figured out the food sensitivities. But why was I getting so sick over the holidays? It's called Christmas tree syndrome. It's called Christmas tree syndrome. You know what that is? It means you're sensitive and are allergic to a Christmas tree. It's really common. So my sister had given me a book on allergies and to help me with my IBS. So I'm going through this. And then it starts talking about, hey, do you get sick over the holiday? You could have Christmas tree syndrome. <laughs> Think about it. There are a couple of issues with Christmas trees. Number one, you're bringing them in from the forest and they've got mold on them. And you're bringing it into your warm house where the mold is going to grow and then going to spore into the air. And then as the Christmas tree gets drier and drier, the, um, the sap in the Christmas tree, get, you start getting that stronger and stronger scent. Christmas tree syndrome is real. And for those of us with IC subtype five, having a Christmas tree in our house might actually be completely overwhelming. So I get the book. I still have the book. I still have the book. It's like the book that changed my life when my sister gave me this book. Um, took the Christmas tree out of the house. Like literally it had been up for two days. Put it on the deck. Within, a, within an hour or two, I felt better. Put it back in the house. Oh God, Jill got really sick again. Took it back out. Got rid of it. And that was when I actually bought an artificial Christmas tree for the first time. And it was, it was stunning to me how much better I felt. I felt so much better when I got rid of the tree. So I want to plant that seed for you guys. For if there's anybody out there, especially those of you who are in IC subtype 5, central sensitization, if you find that you get sick over the holidays, look to your Christmas tree. It actually could be your Christmas tree that could be part of the problem. Hello, Corrine. Okay, so Facebook again. It's still cutting out. I'm just going to... I'm going to keep posting our link here. So anyway, um, that was one of the things that, that um, I wrote about in this article. But, I mean, let's just think about the life of somebody who is sensitive. We are sensitive to our five senses. So we have a sensitive sense of taste. We have a sensitive sense of smell. We have very sensitive skin, a sensitive sense of touch. Um, uh, we have, we can be sensitive with our eyes where if there's a, a lot of flashing lights from a Christmas tree, it actually makes us uncomfortable. So um, I wrote this article called Holiday Survival Strategies for the Sensitive. And from the stress, smell, sounds, foods, and incidental chemical exposure, it's just no wonder that we often feel stressed and anxious during the holidays. Throw in traveling, family expectations, and relationships, and it can feel overwhelming. But a little pre-holiday planning and some suggestions from a sensitivity veteran, hello, uh, may help you have a more enjoyable holiday. So let's just go over a couple of these because I really want you to be able to have a really good holiday. So why do our senses matter? The latest research shows that patients who struggle with chronic overlapping pain conditions are struggling with a sensitive central nervous system. So something as simple as a flickering light or an unusual smell can feel irritating. Touch. 
Okay, so the first sense we're going to talk about is the sense of touch on, and our skin. Okay, having sensitive skin is a hallmark symptom for patients with central sensitization. Thus, gifts of clothing or anything that might touch the skin are rarely successful. I can only wear very soft cotton or modal, and ridiculously, it's the seams which often hurt the most. Thick seams feel like irritating railroad tracks down the inside of my arms. Flannel in all forms, I'm sorry to say, is not for me. So true. Used to love having flannel sheets. Can't do it anymore. It just drives me crazy. Um, clothing with any rough texture does uh, does not work. So if you have to, if you have someone in your life with sensitive skin, make sure you ask them what they are most comfortable wearing. Better yet, a great gift could be a high quality moisturizer like CeraVe or CeraVe Itch Relief Cream, unscented, of course. Okay, let's talk about smell for a moment. Whether it's a from a pine tree scented candles or cinnamon potpourri, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. You walk into some Christmas stores and you are hammered by the smell of pine cones and cinnamon, right? These really, really wrong, strong uh, uh, potpourri type products. Um, patients with central sensitization do not do well with strong odors, yet every holiday someone in my family receives at least one noxious candle or a product that is immediately escorted outside. Keep the strong scents away, or better yet, stick with something more, uh, more simple, like simmering some apple with uh, uh, apple cider with cinnamon on the stove, or if you're looking for a holiday smell in your, uh, if you're looking for a holiday smell in your home. For gift ideas, pass on all perfumes unless they're specifically suggested. I do well with Maria Badescu skin care facial sprays. Like I can do these. If you guys have seen these before, these are super, super light, right? Okay. I can do these. These are fine. But, you know, any of the, except when they <laughs> get my glasses. Um, uh, look for, uh, for candles, look for those made with soy or beeswax made in the USA, right? Okay, just a couple of ideas there. Okay, now what about sound? We have a very sensitive sense of sound. So this is interesting. Is music a point of contention in your home? My brother, for example, always said I was torturing him when I played my music. Um, his choice of language was interesting. Did he actually hate the music or was I, or was his nervous system intolerant to it? I'm honestly not sure. Some prefer loud pounding bass notes while others prefer in instrumentals or praise music. I, for one, do not want to listen to grandma got run over by a reindeer every day or every hour. And yet on the other hand, I do have music on almost every day here in my office, but it's, mu it's music that my body likes. And this is the time when we want to make sure that we're not forcing our music on other people. Thank goodness for headsets, right? Okay, what about taste? Uh, if you or someone in your family's food intolerant or acid sensitive, make sure that you have some foods that they can enjoy too. Don't assume that they can or will eat whatever foods are served. Some foods can legitimately trigger pain and discomfort. Um, that said, central sensitization pa patients might actually enjoy some fun food tests. Um, like uh, trying sampling different cheeses or white chocolates or herbal teas or herbal coffees. And you can find a whole bunch of that stuff over on the IC Network website in our shop. And then what about our vision sensitivity? Don't be surprised if you struggle with bright lights, flickering lights, or even funky patterns on wallpaper, carpet, carpet, or even wrapping paper. It's completely normal to close your eyes and turn away if it's too much. This happened to me at an airport once where I just felt dizzy if I looked at the carpet. I had to look out windows instead. We do better with nature, natural patterns or nature themes rather than really abstract things. Okay. Now, the other thing we have to really ponder here, and, and this is something that I've really tried to understand about my life, is um, I was an introvert. OK, I when I was a kid and growing up and in my 20s, I absolutely an introvert and I'm still an introvert to this to to a certain degree here. Introverts tend to be easily overwhelmed in large crowds. We do better in small groups of one, two or three people. Right. So an introvert is more comfortable with one or two people rather than in large groups of people. They can find a large family gathering exhausting because there's just too much sensory overload. Yes, they can get to a large family dinner, but it may take a day or two at home resting to recover their energy and relax afterwards. 
Introverts often have to recharge their energy in the middle of an event by taking a walk, reading a book, or even playing a computer game alone in a room. Give them that space. It's hard for them to be in a large, loud group, right? Yet when I was in high school, I envied my friend Carolyn, who was an extrovert. She could walk into any class or party and shine in that crowd. I didn't know how she did it. Extroverts thrive on the energy of a family gathering. They love the noise and the energy of a party. They get there, they get there early, they leave late, and they love being in the middle of things. And they, not surprisingly, are baffled by introverts. They don't understand that for some people, group gatherings are stressful and draining, and they can tragically be pretty judgmental about them. Please remind them to give introverts some space. But as we get older, we tend to build some more skills. And introverts eventually start to gain confidence in groups. And there is something called an ambivert. An ambivert is somebody who likes their private time, but they can still walk into a group. And it's funny because like, if you ask me to go to a conference and speak to a thousand people about IC, it's not a problem. I can do it. I can do it. It's fine. You ask me to walk into a room of 10 people I don't know and socialize. Woo, that's hard. That's actually quite hard for me. I mean, I'm getting better, but I still look for the person who feels left out and then I go talk to them, right? <sighs> so uh, anyway, I think it's important that we think about what our comfort zone is. As you consider your holiday gatherings, think about what would make you the most comfortable. Would you rather just have a small meal with a few friends or would you rather attend a big party with extended family and friends? Of course, with COVID, we're really not doing that, but anyway. You have the right to pick events that will give you joy. And of course, there is compromise. If you are expected to drop in, do so for an hour or two or until you're uncomfortable and then feel free to leave. You've made an appearance. You've given the appropriate hugs and good tidings. But ultimately, you've got to care for you, too. Um, anyway, um, there's several other sections in this article. Talk about Christmas tree syndrome. Talk about anxiety. Talk about making the choice to visit or not visit. And like, seriously, guys, if you have any freaking symptoms at all, do not go. If you have a runny nose, if you are sneezing, if you are a little congested, do not go to your Christmas gatherings and potentially affect your family. Please do not do that. We have to, you know, we've kind of stepped away from uh, caring for groups. People are more focusing on more focusing on what they believe is their right. I want you to remember that your job is to protect your family. And if you're having any symptoms at all of anything related to colds, flus, anything, please stay home. I don't want you to go through what some other people have gone through where they accidentally brought COVID into their family and they infected everybody in their family and they lost relatives. I'm one IC patient in particular. You know, it was her sister who did it. Her sister, who was sick, who knew she was sick, who came to visit and infected everybody. And both parents, or uh, the father died. So please, 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 we're not over this yet. COVID is still raging here in California in some areas. So please stay home. This is why we have Zoom. This is why we can do these talks right here. Um, and then, you know, um, um, I'm gonna let you guys read the rest of the article when I post it on our website. Um, as I was doing my research, they were talking a little bit about post-holiday depression. And I didn't really realize this, that somebody, especially extroverts who love the parties, that when it's all over, when New Year's Eve is done, New Year's Day is done, these patients actually end up getting depressed because they're not getting that energy. And so um, come the first week of January, reality hits hard. For some of us, it's a relief to get back to our trusted routine, while for others, it's hard to come back down from the high of the holidays. Remember that the stress of the holidays can leave many, if not most of us, emotionally and physically exhausted. So this is a time to take care of yourself with an icy, friendly diet, good sleep whenever possible, and regular exercise. Better yet, it's a new year. I challenge you to try something new every month in, uh, of next year. What have you wanted to do but let anxiety stop you? Start a new hobby, take a class, join a club, learn how to play the guitar, start a fitness plan. Go for it. You've never been more prepared than you are at this very moment to handle whatever life brings you. So anyway, just, I don't know. I mean, I just, I, I just really realized 
that I personally had trouble with the holidays for about 10 years. And now I know why. All right. So again, for those of you on Facebook, Facebook sucks right now. It's going in and out, in and out. So come on over to YouTube. Okay. So anyway, that's my little, my little spiel. Um, so uh, I'd love to hear your questions. Anybody have any questions? Uh, so Tunes and Morris said Elmer made her hair fall out, uh, liver ends, and her liver enzymes level drive. One of the things about Elmer that a lot of people don't really understand is that it's a blood thinner. So if you went on Elmer for a long period of time and you need to have like a hip replacement surgery or any sort of major surgery, they usually need you to be off of the Elmer for six weeks to two or two or three months. Um, and so Elmeron is, has always been a challenging medication for patients to take. I mean, between the hair loss and the change in liver enzyme levels, it's also really well known for causing some gut distress. Um, and even a year out, if you've been taking it for a year and you've been fine, and then all of a sudden, bam, you've got diarrhea, that's actually happened with some people with Elmeron. It has. David says, oh, honey, David says he has a friend who's very sick in Arizona and it's been in the hospital for two weeks. Yeah. We're not over it, but we're getting there. We're tough cookies. Come on, we're tough cookies. As long as we're smart. And, uh, um, and you know, this is where introverts shine because we like being at home, right? We like reading books. We like doing these things. Uh, COVID is particularly hard for extroverts who thrive on the energy of others. For them, this is very, very difficult. They really they really need that communication and that energy. They get that from other people. So it's a real wake awakening for them or wake up call for them. Hi, Kayleen. Kayleen, how are you feeling today? Any better? Hello, Kareen from Belgium. Yeah, Facebook is just toast. It's just toast, my friends. I'm so sorry. Let's see what else. Let me do, let me tell you what else we're working on here. Oh, hold on. I've got it. Where is it? Where did I put it? Here you go. I'll give you a quick look at the cover, but my, my, uh, my printer is, ink cartridge is going low, but that's the cover. First time in 19 years that we have a redhead on the cover. Yeah. All right. So in this magazine, we talk about, now we know why Lyris failed. Uh, Lyris, as you know, is the what was our most exciting um, new th therapy for uh, hunter's lesions. We call it the lidocaine pretzel. It was the first treatment in history to heal hunter's lesions. Yeah, I'm on the floor. Oh, hold on. My mom's fallen. Hold on. Yeah. Which foot? Which foot? Your right foot or your left foot? Yeah. Okay. Oh. 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 Oh.
Guys, I she's up, but I got to cut it short. Um, she hit her head. All right. So wish me luck. Mom fell. I'll see you later. This is my life right now. Okay.